Okay, we are now into part four of this four-part series that we've had with Sheikh Hassan Talib. We, we've been focusing on a distinct, distinct theme derived from the prophetic Sira, extracting lessons from the prophetic Sira for an intersectional approach to the genocide in Palestine and social justice in South Africa. Uh, this morning, Sheikh Hassan Talib concludes with this very impactful and powerful series focusing on sustaining hope and resilience in the face of adversity. Please do join me in welcoming Sheikh Hassan Talib. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. How are you giving? Alhamdulillah. And to our listeners as well. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> you know what? Sad on the one hand that we're concluding our series, but excited to listen and really, really sort of am to listen to, to what Sheikh has to share with us this morning. Zakallah Khairu. As you have said, Allah A'lam, you know, we are sitting at day number 362. 62. And um, so, so our topic for this morning, I think, is apt for me personally, and I think hopefully it will have some benefit for all of us. So we're talking about sustaining hope and resilience in the face of adversity. And of course, how from a faith perspective, uh, this is something that a Muslim, a believer rather, people of faith um, uh, work on. It is, it's about, it's about faith in Allah. It's about faith in God. It's about going further than faith. It's about yaqeen. Mm. In other words, it's about absolute certainty. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> And how those, uh, you know, who delve into these meetings, uh, rather the meanings of these concepts, these um, abstract concepts, which are of the uh, a'mal or the ibadat, rather, of the hearts of people. And uh, that really form the identities of our souls and the identities of our hearts. Um, these are the kind of uh, re resources, I think, that during these times of adversity and hardships, uh, human beings at their core are able to avail of, and so that they have recourse to a um, to a a source of strength uh, which is beyond um, the natural and which is beyond um, the physical or the here and the now, and so it 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 emanates from the transcendental being Allah Most High Himself. And so I think um, before even starting with the conversation, Ji Khadija, uh, what we have uh, seen um, in abundance is, is, is how uh, the Palestinians um, in, in their struggle have, have managed to teach us uh, during uh, this year that has passed how they have coped and how they have managed. And when we say that, of course, we are being very circumspect when we use this language, but they have shown us how they have uh, managed to, to stay steadfast, how they've managed to stay the cause, uh, despite the untold and sometimes humanly it would appear uh, impossible to bear uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, we we we've also had opportunity to to listen to some of the <clears throat> psychological kind of you know discussions about uh, how they are being described and even though we are using this term as well you know hope and resilience in the face of in the face of adversity but how uh, psychologists have begun to um, problematize the usage of this very term resilience mm. and so it, it it gladdened my heart when in the interfaith space even of solidarity uh, uh, with palestinians our colleagues uh, from christian backgrounds and even from jewish backgrounds begin to use a term which would then uh, almost in a sense uh, find uh, better resonance with those who problematize the term resilience and that is the term sumud um, and sumud I've heard my Christian colleagues uh, use the term sumud sometimes when you know it deluded myself <laughs> and it is uh, a term which the Palestinians use um, basically uh, to 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 refer to steadfastness and the um, you know the the continued resistance um, is is what sumud literally means as opposed to resilience almost in a sense placing a a kind of an expectation that humankind or human beings should be able to withstand, or human beings should be able to have the ability to withstand the most hideous of a 
atrocity, atrocities being heaped upon them. The, as you Khadija may not make sense uh, uh, to 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 clearly right now, but 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 that is the psych, I know the psychological kind of uh, contestations of the terminologies uh, that 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 have been used. As you Khadija have heard yourself maybe um, yeah. uh, in in that in that regard, as you Khadija. <clears throat> I, I, I must say that I draw incredible value from defining terms and concepts mm. clearly. Mm. So I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard these terms <clears throat> and, and, and I appreciate that before we dive deeper into the rest of the topic yeah. that uh, that Sheikh has sort of, yeah. you know, cleared that up and clarified yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, most certainly. And so I think uh, for me, um, the, the, the term here that we will be having recourse to is, of course, or rather of the concepts rather, uh, is first, as we've mentioned, is, is our faith, but also the levels higher than faith, which is our yaqeen. And so literally of the scholars' references to um, yaqeen is that it is the, almost the ultimate of faith. And uh, when they then uh, give further clarity to what that means in terms of the ultimate expression of faith, then they say that is in actual fact the um, manifestation of al-ihsan, where uh, it's almost about saying that what you believe in a sense of concepts which may not be perceptible to the senses, uh, in other words, you experience it, um, but it is so absolutely uh, full. The person is filled with such conviction. It is as if he sees it. And so the concept of al ihsan is, of course, about worshipping God as if you can see him. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. You understand? And then, of course, for ilam takun tarah, but as we know, is if you can't see Allah per se, then you are... F- filled with yaqeen that Allah sees you, on the other hand. And so so, so I think those are, are, are some of the, uh, uh, I think, linkages we would, we would just like to uh, preface um, at, at, at the offset uh, in all of this. And so, of course, the Prophet Sallallahu yes. Alaihi Wasallam has definitely had abundant occasion to demonstrate for us the importance of hope, the importance of perseverance and resilience as we will use it for now as well um, and the Nabi Muhammad وسلم, had certainly of the most challenging times in his own life um, where he had to um, bring forth those um, you know resources those spiritual resources and 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 um, abilities to navigate uh, his path and so, of course, before we go to some of those examples in the life of our beloved Nabi Muhammad yes. sallallahu alaihi wasallam, um, these these uh, uh, principles and these concepts, of course, are being grounded in the Holy Quran itself. And again, the <coughs> Khadija, uh, we take the opportunity as we do, at, literally with every platform, is that when we're talking about the grounding of the principles and the concepts in the Holy Quran, it presupposes that the Quran wants us to take these um, lessons directly from its message, directly from its words. And uh, therefore, we are advised and encouraged each and every single one of us to access the meanings of the Quran and 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 to change our perspective in this regard. We've got to really operationalize within ourselves a paradigm shift that we no longer read the Quran simply reading the Arabic without understanding. Mm-hmm. We've got to read the Arabic with the explicit intention to look up the meanings of those words and to study its meanings, to study those meanings. And so of those references, Sandy Khadija, in this regard, uh, are the ones which which we, um, you know, sometimes very uh, commonly reference. And so of those are in Surah Al-Zumar, uh, and Allah says, وَمَا يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا and so those who are conscious of Allah, those who demonstrate taqwa of Allah, taqwa will... Um, uh, guide you towards your relationship with Allah in that your taqwa, uh, your reliance and faith that you place in Allah will always result in Him providing you with a way out, with a solution, with a resolution to your problem. يَجْعَوْ لَوْ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ 
and he provides for him from angles and avenues that he cannot perceive. Mm. Right, that he cannot perceive. So again, it goes beyond the perception. It goes beyond the sensory, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of perceptions of of human beings. So it's that's going into the realm of faith, going into the realm of yaqeen. But then Allah Taala goes further and He says, uh, and whoever places their trust in Allah, He is sufficient for them." In Allah Baligu Amri, for indeed Allah shall bring His uh, uh, command uh, 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 about. Allah shall bring to fruition His own command. In Allah Baligu Amri, for indeed in Allah's realm, in the realm in which, in the realm of Allah, everything is appointed with its appointed time, everything is determined at its appointed time. But those things are things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, uh, provide us with the um, the spiritual resources to be able to navigate them. And so this is in terms of having the faith, having the sense of uh, complete reliance and trust and faith in Allah, which is reference to the yaqeen. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also again wants to um, uh, remind us that the, the, the life on this dunya, and, and this is what, Palestinian people remind us about many, many times. And we're going to again just touch on a few of these concepts. Life on this dunya is one which by its very nature is meant for trials and tribulations. That the purpose for creation is about being, the purpose for our existence on this dunya is for us to encounter tests from our creator, right? And so Allah speaks how creation of life and death uh, is to determine and to test you who will be best in your works and in your deeds. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, uh, do you think that you will enter Jannah and you have not yet experienced what had been experienced by those who have gone before you? They had been afflicted with trials and tribulations. So this is Allah's sunnah with regards to humankind on this earth. Afflicted with trials and tribulations, even the prophets among them, to the degree that the prophets and those who have faith alongside the prophets would say, when is the help of Allah going to come? Mata Nasrullah. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaffirms and he reassures and he says, Indeed, the victory and the assistance and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forever near. Okay, so that is a, a, a very critical sort of um, uh, construct and, and concept with which the believer also navigates his life. And that is that this life is a test. But then in addition to the fact that it's a test, Allah tests those who are the best of his creation the prophets and those who believe mm. with him. And the Prophet actually explained this when he said that those who are subjected to the severest, the most severe of tests are the prophets of Allah. And then those who are closest in rank to the prophets and those who are close, then those who are closest in rank and to those who are closest in rank to the prophets. And so this is of the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, and as we know, uh, human beings, when we are put through these tests, uh, these tests um, ultimately, yes, as Allah says in the Quran, there may be times when you dislike something, mm -hmm. but it's good for you. And there may be times when you like something, but it's bad for you. And so when we go through these tests, you and I know we can experience even in our limited maybe exposures to adversity in life, how that strengthened us in ways in which we would say, had it not been for having gone through that, I would not have been able to reach this stage in my life of uh, progress and success, etc. For but for having gone through. And so the severity of tests also are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then places in front of his, um, his, his, the cream of his, the creme de la creme of his slaves. That's, mm. that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. And so, the, the the principle then therefore of sacrifice is in it to faith, is in mm -hmm. it to a good life in this world. Nobody is able to live a good life from the Islamic perspective without a perfect and complete willingness to sacrifice. 
right? And so, in the salati, we repeat every day in our salah when we open the salah, when suki, indeed our prayers and our sacrifices, indeed our lives, our, our very life and our death, all of it is placed at the disposal and made ready for sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then lastly, in, in the concepts and Khadija, before we go to the examples of the seer of our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is the ultimate sacrifice. Right? And so the ultimate sacrifice of martyrdom, there isn't a single um, a, a community, especially communities whose objectives and purpose are to attain goodness, to attain um, you know, success and, 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 and really spiritual uh, uh, salvation on, on earth, and, and then to, of course, be uh, reckoned um, by the grace of God to be successful in the year after except that they believed in this notion of the ultimate sacrifice, in other words, martyrdom. And that if, like our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu said, <coughs> that when a people, um, when a people discard the obligation of fighting injustices even with their lives, in other words, to, 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 to um, undertake processes of jihad when they discard that they will be disgraced and humiliated they will be disgraced how many times have we not heard the palestinian people saying that we will resist yes. and stand even if we have to die which is far more prized and far more uh, valued by us as opposed to having to die on our knees. So any human being actually sort of, of course, you know, of makes course, sense. It's a natural thing. But we obviously uh, have to, in a sense, um, you know, remind ourselves about this. So the Prophet ﷺ says, a person who dies and has not reminded himself about, even though we may not have that opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. that he is prepared to fight in the cause of justice and to fight in the cause of Allah, which is the cause of justice, with his life. If he hasn't occupied his thoughts with that during his lifetime, then he has uh, died on a, on, a, on a form of ignorance. Mita al jahiliya, right? And so, the notion then of ultimate sacrifice is one of those concepts in the Holy Quran, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, also, uh, and, and in the Palestinian uh, context for us here today, um, is, is relevant when, when they remind us, when they say, do not ever imagine, don't ever even, don't ever imagine to say that those who were slain in the cause of God, that they are dead. Nay, on the contrary, they are perfectly alive. These are the words of Bal Ahya, Inda Rabbihim Yurzaqoon. They are with their God, with their Lord, still continuing to receive their sustenance. As you and I receive our sustenance, Allah says, He still gives them sustenance. Those are the words that we use in the Quran. Yurzaqoon, Farihina, they are elated and overjoyed with what they have achieved. And they look forward anticipatingly to those who have not yet achieved this that they will also join up with them and tell them there's nothing to worry about. There is no worry, there is no fear, and there is no sorrow in what have, uh, what have befallen them. Yeah, particularly appropriate as we are in this moment of, in, in history, uh, Sheikh Hassan <coughs> Talib uh, speaking to us around today's topic, which is sustaining hope and resilience in the face of adversity as we are into part four of our series extracting lessons from the prophetic Sira for an intersectional approach to the genocide in Palestine and social justice in South Africa. Sheikh, you know, usually I would do a short recap, etc. Yes, but I yes, don't yes. want to take any time away from this. I just want to, the, 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 the sort of what Sheikh ended on, the note yeah. that you ended <clears throat> on was this idea around um, 
You, you know, that when we speak about the principle of sacrifice and that being innate to faith, it's an integral part of faith. And yes, indeed, martyrdom being this, the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. Exactly that. Absolutely. And so martyrdom shahada uh, is also about, like, we just spoke about this in the break now, Khadija, about shahada is about witness bearing. Mm. And so witness bearing in the Quranic context literally means witness bearing to justice. Witness bearing to truth. Allah Ta'ala explicitly relates that in the Quran. So this notion of shahada and martyrdom is about standing up for justice and standing up for truth and bearing witness to justice and witness to truth and standing up against injustice. And so in the Palestinian context, this um, 7th of October, and you've reminded us about Saturday because it's the 5th of October, we're going to have this mass uh, sort of march in solidarity with the Palestinian people. So 7th of October was an unprecedented um, onslaught against injustice, onslaught against impunity, onslaught against, um, you know, the, the impunity that the occupation has enjoyed for almost a century, right, for 75 years and more, uh, ne never ever being held accountable. This was a preeminent exercise in holding them accountable by resisting the injustice, by standing up against them, and of course, hitting back. Yeah, That's the resistance. And so therefore, Nikhadija, also as South Africans, I really need to um, clear this point is that we mustn't ever underestimate what the South African government had done when it took the occupation to the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. That was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. It was standing up against injustice and holding them accountable and bearing witness to justice against the injustice. And so Allah's law is, is that if you allow impunity to perpetuate unchecked and uh, without any kind of consequence, then you will taste the wrath of Allah in the sense that that will envelop all of you. Because then you are complicit. You are complicit. You are complicit. And it will then, we just spoke also about the injustices in our country in terms of corruption. Yes. The corruption will, uh, will not abate. It will continue until we as citizens take our responsibility of holding not only government, not only um, uh, 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 private uh, enterprises and corporations and business, but wherever corruption occurs, if we do not stand up against it and hold those people accountable, uh, we are number one, we are complicit, and number two, we are then also uh, deserving of the fact that it will permeate society, and we will become of those who suffer directly under it as well. And so shahada is, is not just shahada taking the ultimate sacrifice, mm -hmm. but it's what leads up to that, or the, 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 that is the potential outcome of what you re require to do of bearing witness against injustice, which is what happened on the 7th of October, which is what the resistance, and now the resistance also in Lebanon. I mean, since we have la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, started with a conversation around this, now it has expanded yes. even. Uh -huh. This injustice has even expanded, right? And so that is for us, uh, Allah knows best, and a, a harbinger of, of either that this will further escalate, Allah knows best, but again, it's about uh, human society, uh, taking the responsibility and as you've said so correctly in your introduction before we started everybody is a leader because in Islam the Prophet Sallallahu says literally Kullukum ra'in each and every one of you is a leader and you'll be held responsible with regards to those whom you lead and so whether it's a, 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 a mother in, in the context of her, of, of her children whether it's a father in the context of his household we are all accountable we are going to be held accountable because we're all leaders. As you've literally said, uh, Khadija, I, I remember those those points that you started out with. Um, but but to to link that also to then what hap what inshallah will be happening on Saturday when we're having the march. We are all going there with a view that I am standing together collectively. Uh, sometimes we have to stand alone, sometimes stand, to stand collectively. This is one of those moments where we're standing collectively with, um, you know, entire uh, the entire society building alliances across cultures, across faiths, across uh, all sorts of uh, barriers uh, where we're standing up against. 
against the injustice in unison. And that's what the march is about on Saturday. And so therefore, it behooves and it's really obligatory on every Muslim. To, it's obligatory on every Muslim unless we have something uh, pressing that prevents us from being there. And so I just wanted to make that point uh, about Shahada and uh, bearing witness, of course, to injustices, uh, precisely what, what the Palestinian resistance, what the um, uh, Lebanese resistance uh, is showing us today. And so um, it's, it's important for us to, to factor those. And so in, in the life of our beloved Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Khadija, you will recall uh, that of the worst experiences, near death experiences, one arrow away from death, that the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever experienced was during the Battle of Uhud. So in the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face was, in a sense, you know, uh, almost disfigured. He, 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 he had lost a tooth in there. He had cuts and bruises on his face. And he bled and, and, and he, he had um, also uh, suffered um, uh, uh, injury on, on, on the battlefield. So it was the toughest and worst uh, uh, experience of the Nabi Muhammad. So Sayyidina Aisha, his wife, she asks him, was there anything worse than Uhud that you ever experienced? And he says, you know what I experienced at the hands of your people. And he's referring to a day which he calls Yawm al And Aqaba is like the steep, um, almost in a sense, incline. It's like a difficult road, right? The Aqaba. There's a reference to this in the Quran as well. وَمَا أَدَرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَ Nonetheless, he calls that Yawm al because it's the day when he went to go and deliver the message after having been persecuted by the Quraysh in Mecca. He then decides on that t- at that time to go to he, the, other, the other clans in uh, the Bani Thaqif in Ta'if. So when he goes to Ta'if, and he says to Aisha, you know what they did there with me. And so that's the time when they, after what he suffered at the hands of the Quraysh, after also experiencing the death and the protection, death of his uncle and the political protection under the uh, patronage of his uncle, he then goes to uh, Ta'if and there they not only mock and ridicule him to reject him and, and really, in a sense, uh, chase him away they set the children on him to pelt him and throw rocks at him and to the extent that the prophet's face and his body becomes drenched in blood drenched in blood people this is the explanation of how the prophet's experience was in in taif and some exp- ex- uh, descriptions go to the extent that his sandals became became clogged in blood in blood in his blood he says to her I was so, the, the torment of that, so this is the psychological torment that the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about. He says, I was so tormented by that experience that when I left that place, I was in a daze. I did not know where I was. I did not know what I was doing until I, I, I reached Bani Tha'alib. Bani Tha'alib was a place, Khadija, about eight kilometers away from there. He says, only when I reached Bani Tha'alib did I realize, almost like as if I came to my senses, what, what was actually happening. So the psychological torment was severe. And the Prophet Sallallahu then says, as I then came to my senses, I saw a cloud. And this cloud was a, a shining cloud. And in there, I saw Jibreel. And Jibreel said to me, Muhammad, here is the angel in charge of the mountains on earth. If it is your instruction, he will take the mountains and he will obliterate the people of Ta'if out of existence. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, No, I am hopeful and I pray that of their offspring, their progeny who will come later on, will be of those who proclaim that there is no God worthy of worship, save Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here is an example of how the Prophet ﷺ have gone through the worst day in his life. He says that was the worst day wow. in his entire life. Yawmul Aqaba, he calls it. Wow. Right? Strong words. And the words and the, and, the, and the torment wasn't physical. It was psychological mm-hmm. torment, he says. Because I didn't know where I was. I could not 
I could not make sense of what happened after I left there. I don't know what happened after I left there until I reached a place which is eight kilometers. That's walking eight kilometers. Right? And so, but listen to this part. So in all of this, when the Prophet ﷺ now had at his disposal the angels as Jibiril himself and the angel in, in charge of, of the mountains. The Prophet Sallallahu still at, at such a point of torment and at such a point of having been dejected and having been almost brought to the lowest ebb in his entire life, he still has the composure. He still has the, 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 the presence of heart and mind to, to not give in to his... Uh, to his um, lower self and demand almost in a sense or to effect retribution by allowing the angel of the mountains on his offer to obliterate those people who just treated him in the way that they did. So the Prophet ﷺ, of course then dis displays here the measure of magnanimity and clemency. To the, to, the, to the very people who heaped all of this abuse and all of this uh, pain on top of him, which represented the worst day in his life. Which is also, again, the Khadija, one of those uh, sort of spiritual, um, uh, uh, you know, moments of, of, of learning and teaching for us, where the Prophet ﷺ demonstrates to us how a believer responds, how faith makes you respond. It doesn't make you vengeful. Mm. And this is what we see, the contrast between the Palestinian people and the Israeli occupiers. The, the, the way in which the bombing is taking place right now is about eliminating a people. Like the uh, newscasts and, and all the analysis go around, there is no military objective to any of this. It's just about pure, brute, um, uh, 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 inhumane, annihilation and an elimination of a people. So look at how that contrast and 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 sometimes Radija and, and, and sorry this is maybe gonna take too too much time, but um, when one looks at the responses that has come even from from Lebanon and yes. from Iran, they have for me in how I'm trying to make sense of it been targeted to still not go into areas where there are sort of residential places where people live, but rather to try and come closer to the places where military bases may be, for example. And you're not going to find a lot of people mm, in those locations. You know, mm. I'm trying to make sense of that in that way, but, but I'm beginning to kind of formulate a picture in my mind of why it is that when the responses are coming and we've heard that there had been, for example, uh, so many, uh, 200, for example, ballistic missiles, uh, being launched at um, Israel the night before, but we haven't heard of, bes besides the Iron Dome and all of these things, but we haven't heard of casualties. Mm. You understand? And so I think that's the contrast that, that, that needs to be observed here as well. And so the Prophet said, maybe as our last point, you will remember in Khadija, even when you know he came to the point again where he was politically ascendant now, uh, at the, towards the end of his life, and they then uh, marched onto Mecca, with the conquest of Mecca, without a shedding a single drop of blood, the Quraysh, who his staunch, you know, persecutors and 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 the people who oppressed and and and, and tortured them, right? They were worried what's going to happen to them. And as the Prophet Sallallahu entered Mecca, they were looking at his face, trying to ascertain what what is he going to say, what is he going to take vengeance now? And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that moment said to them, "I'm going to say to you what the Prophet." Yusuf said to his brothers, and he said, "La tathriba alaykum al-yom, antum muttalaqa. Idhabu fa antum muttalaqa. There is no, there is no retribution that's going to happen today on you. Go proceed. All of you are free to go." So this is the 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 spirit with which the Prophet sallallahu demonstrates how when the upper hand is regained. And this is in history itself, you know, Salahuddin, the very yeah. famous way in which Salahuddin had retaken Jerusalem after the 90 years that Jerusalem had spent under the Crusaders. And the way that the Crusaders, in contrast, took Jerusalem, it was a bloodbath. Mm. Nothing was spared. The Jews in particular were routed 
and 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 the blood uh, uh, of course flowed and and they were also not allowed to to be inside Jerusalem when Salahuddin re-entered Jerusalem 90 years later he called the Jews back he then established schools for the children of the Crusaders <laughs> to be able to continue and so this is I think the contrast of faith and where you have just brute force brute um, uh, evil uh, sort of brute um, you know just in a sense um, um, uh, monstrous monstrous sort of inhumanity that 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 kind of is contrasted with faith and these are the Khadija for us I think the ways in which from an Islamic perspective um, Muslims are able to then and, and people of faith generally are able to then say um, how we how do we sustain ourselves during uh, times like this? How do we uh, retain our composure during times like this? How do we uh, continue, um, uh, you know, to to keep um, uh, 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 to keep going and to stay the cause with uh, the sumud uh, that that we have heard those terminologies from the Palestinians, the steadfastness and the commitment to resistance and sustaining hope uh, in the face of adversity that indeed. Uh, in the Qareeb, that indeed the victory and the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is ever near. <clears throat> On that note, yes, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. We're hoping we can continue because we realize there's a lot more uh, to be said, you know, in, in, in also in terms of the, the, the implementation and how to manifest this in practical terms. We've spoken about these universal values. Sheikh Ihsan, shukran so much for joining us these past three weeks. Inshallah, we'll continue. Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure and honor. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa